And we are going to begin uh, a study in this book. It's going to be a shorter study than our last book. Obviously, 2 Timothy is a little bit shorter. Um, there are going to be <coughs> uh, a, a couple of the uh, topics that we dealt with in the last discussion uh, will not be in this one. In fact, this really is going to be a heavy emphasis on the importance of sound doctrine. It's going to be a huge uh, encouragement to us, especially someone who's in ministry or thinking about ministry, but it's really not just for those who are in ministry per se, but really there's a lot of practical instruction in this book here. Second Timothy chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 5 together, and then we're going to dig into a very interesting topic. Second Timothy 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy." When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which first dwelt in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Now, when we deal with the passage that we're going to look at this evening, I want you to realize that there are lots and lots of details that we really could dig into tonight. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to just get a big picture view of this text. I'd like us to get kind of the main details that Paul is writing down as he begins this letter to Timothy. And so in order to do that, I want to start with a simple purpose statement. And then from there, I want to talk about a couple of introductory things that I think are helpful to us to help us understand some of the weight of what's in front of us. But here's a simple summary statement. The purpose of the section was to greet Timothy and to encourage him to step up and take the responsibilities of ministry that were soon to be left in Paul's absence. I want to emphasize Paul is challenging Timothy to step up. He's saying, be a man. He's saying, be responsible. He's saying, take on the duties that God has equipped you and given to you. And one of the reasons that he really needs to do this is because Paul recognizes that his ministry is coming to an end. The Apostle Paul realizes that his days on this earth are few. And so at the end of his life, he wants to challenge Timothy, when I'm gone, don't drop the ball. In fact, step up and do what God wants you to do. And so that's really the, the whole sense of the book that's in front of us. And that's really the sense of what Paul is trying to challenge Timothy with here in the beginning. You know, how you start a letter and how you, how you finish a letter Many times are some of the first and last impressions, the things that you probably think the most about. And so he's really going to emphasize the importance of Timothy being responsible here in the beginning. If we look at this passage, the thing that we'll see that God wants us to do is he wants us to step up and he wants us to make the most of the opportunities that God has for us, just like he wanted Timothy to do the same thing. And so the question before us is how do we do that? How can we be people who are motivated properly, who will step up and make the most of the ministry opportunities that we have in front of us? Well, I want to begin, first of all, by giving you a couple of introductory details. And these are things that are not necessarily stated in the text of Scripture, but as you study this book, as you kind of see what Timothy's saying, you, you think about the timing of this letter, these are some of the things that are going on during the time that Paul is writing this letter to Timothy. The first thing we're going to say is this. This letter was written at the end of Paul's life and ministry. In fact, later on in the book, he's going to say, the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul is saying those things because he recognizes that he's about to go into eternity. And part of that reason that he realizes that is because he's in prison. And as he's in prison, he understands that he's going to stand on trial, and it's very likely that Paul is going to be executed because of his faith in Christ. Well, what's very interesting is that early on in Paul's ministry, 
there really was very little persecution from Rome on the Christian church. But that changed when there was a great fire in Rome. Maybe if you've studied history, you know the story about how there was a terrible fire in Rome. And Nero got tremendous pressure from the people that lived there in Rome because they believed that he was the instigator of the fire. They believed that it was likely that Nero was the one who set the city ablaze. And so rather than Nero facing the consequences of people's anger, he began to divert attention from himself. And he said, there's a group of people in Rome that are responsible. It's not me, it's the Christian community. And all of a sudden, Nero began to focus his energy on giving this uh, to the Christian community. And basically, he used them as a scapegoat. Well, at that point, the persecution that was facing the church went from being primarily a Jewish persecution. So wherever there was a Jewish population, those were the places that you would see persecution. Think about the example of when Paul went and he preached the gospel in Ephesus. What happens? There's an uproar in Ephesus, and all the people that are merchants that are making money there, they get in an uproar. But one of the things that we see is in a lot of these cities, it was those within the Jewish community that really stirred up that, that group of people to go against the churches. We see that when, when he's in Jerusalem, when Paul's in Jerusalem, there's a huge uproar about him being in the temple itself and having brought Gentiles into that area. And it's the Jewish population that goes after him. Well, what we see is that there was a change from the Jewish population being primarily where there was persecution to it coming from Rome. Now, by the way, the Romans had a lot more authority. They had a lot more power. And within a few generations, the Roman Empire is going to be doing everything in their power to stamp out Christianity. And we know the stories of Christians in the that are having to hide in the catacombs because they're in great danger. We hear the stories about Christians being brought into the Colosseum. Well, all of that really began with Nero. And so what we need to recognize is that Paul is in prison, Nero is the emperor, and now Christians are beginning to face persecution as a result of those things that were going on in Rome when there was this great fire. So as he's writing to Paul, as Paul is writing to Timothy, He's recognizing that his life is about to end, and he's also recognizing that Timothy is going to be tempted because of the current situation that was starting to get very hot on Christians. He was going to be tempted to kind of pull back, to not be in such a public kind of a ministry, and to just kind of do things quietly on the side. You know, I've heard people say this, persecution is something that causes the church to grow and to flourish. I want you to realize that there is a sense in which that's true, and there's also a sense in which it's not true. Now, the sense in which it's true is that the church is going to be more pure in the sense that if you're going to get baptized and you're going to identify with the church and you're going to gather together with them and it's going to cost you something, you're going to make sure that you're serious about the Christian faith, okay? It's going to be a little bit harder for somebody to say, oh yeah, I'll do that just because it's easy. No, it's not going to happen. But on the other side, when there's persecution on the Christian church, many times there's a lack of leadership in those churches. Part of the reason is because pastors get thrown in prison. And when you don't have leadership, what happens? People begin to drift. Well, somebody steps into that leadership position, and guess what? They end up in the same place. People are not as free to go and proclaim the gospel in their communities because they know that they might be caught and imprisoned, and terrible things can happen to them. So we need to recognize that this issue of persecution is kind of, on one sense, it can, it can be a positive outcome where Christian, the Christian church is refined. On the other side, it can also be extremely detrimental. So Paul understands that Timothy is going to have a tendency to pull back because of the pressure. And that really has a lot to do with why he writes what he writes in these verses. So that's kind of an introduction. Let's dig into the contents of what Paul actually says to Timothy in this text. There are three distinctions that really characterize the way that Paul writes the letter, and these three characteristics or distinctions should really characterize our ministry. If we want to have a ministry that really sees the baton pass from one generation to the next generation. So let's look at these three distinctions. First of all, 
we must be committed to Christ's authority. Now you might say, where in the world do you see a statement about Christ's authority in verses 1 through 5? Let me read this to you and see if you can pick it out. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Can you see something in that verse that tells you Paul was committed to the authority of Christ? I hope that there are two things that stand out to you. The first is the phrase, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. We should ask ourselves the question, when Paul makes that statement, when he makes that claim, when he identifies himself that way, why does he do that? What is really bound up in that statement, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ? And the second statement that should really stand out to us is the statement, by the will of God. The question is, why does he make those two statements? Well, because this really indicates where Paul's authority lies. It really indicates where the authority of the message that Paul preached week in and week out was lying. It really ultimately talks about where the authority is behind what Paul wrote. When Paul says he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, he's saying, I have authority to speak on God's behalf. Now, this was touched on a little bit on Sunday night because Hansel was talking about in Galatians how Paul was identifying himself as an apostle. I want you to recognize, though, that the reason he identifies himself as an apostle in this context, and the reason that he identifies himself as an apostle in the Galatians context, has a similarity, but it also has a distinction. And I want to talk about that a little bit tonight. But we see that his authority really really rests in the fact that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Secondly, we see his motivation. What drove Paul was that he had a calling from God. He says, I'm an apostle by God's will. Paul wasn't looking for the opportunity to be called an apostle. He was called out by God. In fact, we could go beyond it. Paul was actually going against God's authority. He was going to Damascus and he was saying, I want to take Christians and I want to put them in prison. And as he's going in rebellion to the Lord Jesus Christ, He meets him on the road to Damascus. You want to talk about a confrontation. You want to talk about God saying, it's difficult for you to kick against the pricks. In other words, you're fighting me and you're not going to win, Paul. (laughs) So when he talks about his authority and his motivation, it's bound up in the fact that God called him and God commissioned him. So those two statements are very important. Let's begin talking about his authority, first of all. I want to make this statement. Paul did not open the epistle with the phrase, Paul an apostle, in all of his epistles. In other words, in some of his epistles, he didn't actually call himself an apostle. He was an apostle. He had every right to call himself that way, but he didn't in all of his epistles. Let me give you an example. Like in Philippians, it says this, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ. And that word servant is the exact same word that was used of someone who is a servant in bonds or a slave. So when Paul is writing the book of of Philippians, he's going to emphasize the fact that those Christians needed to be servants of Christ, just like he was a servant of Christ. In fact, really when Paul writes that letter, he is writing it from a position not so much of authority, but of humility. He has authority, don't get me wrong. It's God's word, okay? But he's writing it, humanly speaking, as a servant to servants. So he's setting the tone. In the book of Romans, it's interesting. He does talk about his apostleship, but he says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel. But before he talks about his authority, he talks about the fact that he's a servant. That's extremely important. In other words, that's a major emphasis in the book of Romans. He's going to emphasize not just authority and doctrine, but humility and service. And then Philemon, we know the story of Philemon. Philemon was a man who had a servant who stole from him, and then he runs for his life, and Paul meets this man, and this man is gloriously saved. And then Paul says, you need to go back to your master, you need to make right what you stole from him. But before you do that, I'm going to write a letter on your behalf, and I'm going to appeal to this man, who is my friend, who is my brother in Christ, 
And I'm going to tell him, if this man owes you anything, charge me. It's a pretty amazing story. But this is how he writes it. He says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. There's a reason that I bring this up to you. I want you to realize that Paul is setting the tone in each of his epistles. Where he's going to move in that letter, he's kind of preparing those people by the way he introduces himself. So the question is, why does he call himself an apostle when obviously Timothy knows he's an apostle? He not only knows he's an apostle, but he's not questioning his authority in any way. This is a very compassionate, loving, close kind of a relationship between them. (coughs) Why does he do that? Why does he identify himself the way that he would in a book like Galatians, where his apostleship is in question? Or a book like 1 and 2 Corinthians, where the church has an issue with him? Why does he do it this way? I think the reason that he establishes his authority is because he wants Timothy to understand that he's about to pass the baton off to this young man. He's about to step off of the scene. And to put it very simply, is reminding Timothy of his authority so that it will establish the basis for Timothy's ministry in his absence. What's very interesting is that when Paul is gone, Paul is gone, but Paul's ministry continues. When Peter is gone, Peter's ministry continues. You say, how does that happen? What happens because God used them to give us his word. And every time Timothy would get up and preach from the book of Ephesians, or Galatians, or Philippians, or whatever book was written by Paul, Paul's ministry continues because it's been written, and it's been preserved, and it's being expounded. And Paul is going to remind Timothy that as I'm an apostle, and this is where my authority lies, when you carry on in my absence, you're going to be preaching and teaching from what I've left you. That's really what he's saying. In fact, we see this sense in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 5 to 8. He says, watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but also to all them that love his appearing." In 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, he says, Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And my question is, when he says, Preach the word, what word is he talking about? He's talking about what he wrote. <laughs> Do you understand? He's talking about all the Old Testament scriptures, and he's talking about all the New Testament scriptures. And he's basically saying to Timothy, I did my job. I preached, I taught, I started churches. I'm going to die and I'm going on to glory. And I've written God's word. I have written it on his behalf and it's been kept for you. And you need to take this and you need to preach it and you need to teach it. And so what's he doing? He's reminding Timothy of his authority. Because when Timothy gets up and teaches, the authority that Timothy has is going to be connected to the authority that God gave to the Apostle Paul as he writes those words. So really, his motivation was that he wanted this young man, Timothy, to be a faithful, faithful man. We then move on from that to his motivation. Paul did not pursue this ministry because of ambition. Paul's sole motivation was the calling of God. This will, this will was significant because through Tim, though Timothy was not an apostle like Paul, and he did, not, he did have a God-given calling. And with that calling came a sacred trust. And so Paul not only talks about his authority, but he talks about his motivation to say, just like God called me to a role, an apostle, and I'm going to be gone, God's called you to a role, to carry on in my absence. We then move on to a second truth. So we've talked about Paul's, uh, we've talked about the importance of God's authority. The second truth we're going to find is this, we must be convinced of the power of the gospel. Now, this is really interesting. In verse 1, he says this. It is according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. 
Let me say that again. It is according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> now, now, Paul is talking about the fact that he's an apostle, that he's called of God to a task, to a ministry, but this ministry is connected to the promise of life. And the promise of life is something that is rooted in the person of Christ. So I want us to kind of break down those little details one at a time. Three important statements. First of all, we have the words, the promise. That phrase, the promise, means this is primarily a future reality. If something is a promise, it's not something that I'm experiencing right now. It's something I'm anticipating right now, and I'm anticipating it based on something somebody told me. I want you to realize that when we talk about the benefits of the gospel, we can look at those benefits really from three different time, time tenses. We can look at it in the past. When I trusted Christ as my Savior, God forgave me, He cleansed me, He declared me righteous. That happened then. I'm still enjoying the benefits of that now, and I'm going to enjoy them forever. We could say that's the past tense. In fact, really, when the Bible talks about a Christian being justified, it generally speaks of it in terms of the perfect tense. You have been justified. It happened then, and you continue to be in that position. That's the sense. We can also look at our, 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 our salvation in the present sense. When I say the present sense, I am positionally righteous in Jesus. But the bottom line is, I am not perfect, holy, and righteous in the way that I live my life. Now, I try to be, okay, but I never attain that. As long as I'm living in this fallen world and I'm a fallen creature, I'm going to battle with sin. I think about what Paul says in Romans chapter 7. He says, the things that I don't want to do, I do them. And the things that I do want to do, I don't do them. And he says, who shall deliver me from this bondage? In Romans chapter 6, he talks about how we need to reckon ourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies that you submit yourself to the will of your flesh. Why does he speak in those terms? Because in the present reality, we battle with sin. And so the fact is, there's an aspect to our salvation that we are dealing with in the moment till we enter into eternity. But there's a third aspect of our salvation. We call this glorification. And that is the aspect of our salvation that we've not yet experienced. It is future. In fact, we tend to use the term, it is our hope. Now, when we say hope, we don't mean like, oh, I hope I'm going to experience it. It's a steadfast reality in the future that's rooted in the promise of God. That's the sense that he's talking about here. When he talks about the promise, he's saying, we are saved, but there's a part of our salvation that we've not yet experienced. This is the completion of our salvation. This is when I'm no more dealing with the fallenness of my humanity. I'm not battling with my flesh anymore. I'm with God forever. This is what he's talking about. So when he talks about the power of the gospel, he's emphasizing the fact that this is something I'm going to taste forever. Titus 1-2, he talks about it being in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began. In other words, when we think about our salvation, we know it's guaranteed because it's rooted in the promise of God. In Titus 3, 7, he says that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So he talks about being justified in the past, standing righteous in Christ in the present, battling with sin in the present, but being guaranteed of eternity with God forever based on the promise of God, the hope of eternal life. And I think of Romans 8, where Paul writes, for all of our Southerners, I reckon <laughs> that, this su that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall future be revealed in us. The earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, when Paul talks about the promise of life, he's talking about the future element of our salvation. We've not tasted it yet. We know it's coming. 
We wait for it, but it's guaranteed. He then talks about how this is life in its truest sense. We see this as a promise of life. You know, we, talk, we hear people talk about quality of life. You ever hear that phrase, quality of life? Well, when we talk about quality of life, I want you to realize something. There is a kind of life that is superior than living on this world. It's called eternal life. It's a life with God where we have perfect joy and peace with Him and we know Him and we enjoy Him and we actually relate to Him the way that He intended us to relate to Him. When he talks about the promise of life, he's talking about life in its truest form. Like in 1 John 1, where he says this, That which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. The life was manifested. We have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Now, this is really interesting what he says. That which we've seen and heard declare we unto you, that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Now when he talks about life in 1 John, he's not just talking about the fact that we exist and we're physically alive. But he's talking about a vibrant walk with God that enjoys peace. It enjoys fellowship. It enjoys a joyful existence in relation to God. We then see that life, this life finds its source in Christ. He says it's, it is that life which is in Christ Jesus. We don't have this life through the law, through the church, through some rituals, through some money that we give. We can only get this life in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's impossible to have eternal life apart from Him. It's, a part, it's impossible for us to get this life that He talks about any way but through the finished work of Christ. And what's really interesting is this was really a major emphasis in Christ's ministry. In John 4, think about what He said to the woman at the well. Jesus said, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, Thou wouldest have asked him, he would have given thee living water. And the woman said, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with this well is so deep, and from whence hast thou this living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof? Jesus answered and said, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Do you see the connection? Jesus says, you want real life? I'm the source. And he uses the illustration of water. You know, when you're thirsty and you're parched, you go and you you draw the water out and you drink it, and then you feel satisfied, but then it's gone. And you got to do it again and again and again. And he says, I'm the source of true life that will always satisfy you. That's what he's saying. And John 17, 3 says, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The point that I'm trying to make here is that when Paul starts this letter, he emphasizes his authority, and he emphasizes the power of the gospel. And the fact is, if you want to pass on the truth from one generation to another, biblical authority has to be emphasized, and so has the power of the gospel. But there's a third that I'll mention here as well. And that is that we must develop deep relationships with one another. In verses 3 to 5, he says, To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, he says, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which First dwell in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in thee also. I want you to notice what he says to this young man. The first thing he says is that he has a deep affection for Timothy. So deep that it's as if it's his own child. Now I know you moms and dads know what this is like. You know, you get up in the morning, 
I'm sitting there in my chair. I got my coffee, been doing some reading, and my little daughter comes down the stairs. Okay, Lydia's the one that's, she's, she's the one that'll melt your heart these days. Well, sometimes, <laughs> not always. And she'll come down the stairs, and she'll just get this big smile. And she'll come right up to my chair, and I'll pick her up, and I'll sit her there in my lap, and she'll just, she's in her glory, and so am I. You know what I'm talking about? Because that's your child. You just, you feel this affection for that, that child. This is my son. This is my daughter. That's how Paul felt about Timothy. He puts it like this, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. And that phrase, dearly beloved, it's, it's, a, it's actually a derivative of the word agapao. We know about agape love. But the idea is, he said, when I think about you as my son, I think about you with this, this deep affection. We also see that Paul prayed continually for Timothy's success in ministry. He says, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience without ceasing. I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. You know, as a pastor, I think about people in the church who are going through great difficulties. And I think about them often. In fact, you know, at any given time, there are going to be lots of different people that will be on my mind. It could be somebody with a health issue. It could be somebody that's dealing with a financial burden. It could be an area where they're dealing with temptation, struggle. There are all kinds of different things that people within a church context deal with. And so as a pastor, you think about this. But I'm in one congregation, okay? I mean, it's not a huge church. The Apostle Paul was involved in all kinds of church plants. He's involved in lots and lots of church plants. He knew lots and lots of Christians. There were lots of people that he partnered with in ministry. But he says, I continually think about you, Timothy. I continually pray for you, Timothy. Out of all the people that the Apostle Paul felt the burden to remember in prayer, Timothy was the top one on the chart. What does that tell you? It tells you that he really loved this man. He really believed that this guy had a true heart for God. He trusted him. He wanted to encourage him. This is the kind of heart that Paul had for Timothy. We see a third thing that's very interesting here. He had an overwhelming longing to spend time with Timothy. He says, he greatly desiring to see thee. And what's so interesting is that word desiring, believe it or not, this might sound strange, but that's the exact same word that is translated lust in other parts of the Bible. Now, he doesn't mean this in a lustful way at all. The word simply means a strong passion. But we understand, when we talk about lust, that this is something that can like completely consume us and drive us. And it's like we're not thinking clearly many times because of this very strong passion. What's interesting is Paul uses the same word when he talks about someone who has a desire to be a pastor. And the idea is that this is a person who is driven and is internally compelled to do the work of the ministry. He's not using this term in a sense that is sinful. He's not using it in a sense that's inappropriate at all. He's simply saying this is a strong burden. It's a burden that can go the wrong direction when it comes to lust, but it can also be something that, that drives us and motivates us in a positive way. And what he's basically saying is, Timothy, I have this intense longing to be in your presence so that I can invest in you, that we can enjoy fellowship together because we have this deep bond like a father and son together. We see, fourthly, Paul knew that Timothy was concerned about his own well-being. He says he was mindful of his tears. It's interesting, Paul doesn't say his own tears, he says Timothy's tears. In other words, Timothy was really concerned about Paul. He knew that Paul was going to die. He knew that Paul was at the end of his life. And that burdened Timothy. But what does that tell you? <clears throat> that tells you that there's this very sweet bond between these two individuals. And last, we see that Paul was grateful for the deep fellowship that they enjoyed in the gospel. He says that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. When he says unfeigned, he's saying, you're the real deal, Paul, uh, Timothy. And by the way, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, Paul was not like, he was not a compromiser, okay? 
Like this guy, he called it like it was. If Paul, if Paul says that you are a genuine, legit guy, he means it, okay? He wasn't going to play games. How does Paul come to that conviction? It's because they had enjoyed sweet fellowship together. They had ministered together. They had given the gospel together. They had traveled together. Paul had confidence in this young man. And you say, why do I emphasize it? I emphasize this to say it this way. If one generation is going to pass the baton to the next generation, which really is what 2 Timothy is all about, it's about Paul saying, Timothy, it's your turn. You go run. I'm done. I don't mean I'm done like I quit. I'm done because God says you've run enough. It's time for me to take you home. How does that baton get passed? Biblical authority. Understanding the power of the gospel and people really having close, deep bonds as brothers and sisters in Christ. So very important. One of the reasons sometimes that churches don't go from one generation to the next is that whether it's in the leadership, whether it's in family life, Whatever it is, we don't pass the baton on well because in some way we fall short in these three critical components. And so it's important that they're a part of our ministry lives. Whatever stage in the race we're in, maybe we're on the early side, maybe we're in the middle, maybe we're at the end of the race, we've got to invest in people so that these three qualities are in the kinds of ministries that we have. God wants us to step up and make the most of our ministry transitions So we need to have ministries that are characterized by these distinctions. Let's ask the Lord to help us to do that. Let's bow together in prayer, please. Father, thank you for this text of Scripture. I know it's just the introduction to the book, but there's really a lot here. There's a lot of really interesting content, a lot of wonderful truths packed in there. And clearly the tone is being set for a very personal letter. I pray that you'd help us as we dig into these passages to really be fed spiritually, be challenged and encouraged. Father, help us to be obedient to you. I pray that as we get to the end of our ministry lives, that we would be able to pass the baton onto the generation behind us. That they would take it and they would run with it in our absence because we have prepared them well. We ask that these qualities would truly be distinct in our own personal and corporate ministries. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.